Professor Stuart Thomas. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chris. Um, many people ask me how I got into this area, so I thought I'd give you a bit of a background into me and um, why I work in forensic mental health. Um, my interest generally is on the interface between criminal behaviour, mental health and deviance. Um, more specifically, and what I'm going to talk to you about today, is about policing and mental health. How did I get into this? Well, I blame it on my grandfather, actually. He was a copper. He was a copper in England in a seaside town. A seaside town which was nestled in between a naval base and an army barracks. And he used to delight, scare the hell out of me, and um, really amuse me with all these different stories about the people he's coming into contact, some of the challenges around policing, around drunkenness, around violence. Um, and I was really taken with that. Some 30 years later, my best friend from school joined the Metropolitan Police in London. He's also told me of similar stories, but he's also said there's some really quite different things happening now. And we really need to understand that to sort of see what's going on and to see how and if uh, the police is still meeting the needs of the community. <coughs> So I moved to Australia seven and a half years ago. I was soon approached by Victoria Police, and they actually came to me with a proposition. They said, we need you to partner with you and your research group to understand um, why the police are coming into contact so frequently with people who are mentally ill. For us, we think this is a significant problem, but we need the research to back that up. We have no evidence, we just have anecdote, we have intuition, and we have what's, um, the views from the officers on the ground saying, you know, we need to do something about this. What we're doing isn't working, and this is a big problem. So we actually engaged in what's called an um, ARC linkage grant, which partners up universities, hospitals, and um, organisations, in this case the police, to um, sort of address this complex problem. <coughs> now, I'd just like to start with a statistic to try and give you some sense of the impact of this area, the public health impact in terms of mental health. You may be quite shocked by this. Basically, one in two Australians will experience mental illness during their life. What that means is if you don't experience mental illness yourself, then the chances are the person next to you will be. Now, in order to understand the complexity and frequency of the police encounters with people who are experiencing mental illness, we need to understand that there's been a whole movement, a whole change in the provision of health services over the last 30 years or so culminating in the late 1990s, where deinstitutionalisation occurred across many um, countries, including in Australia, and people who were mentally ill, who were once cared for in hospitals, were actually now cared for predominantly in the community. If you add to this the change in policing from the traditional role of locking up the um, bad guys to actually um, proactive policing, community policing, engaging with communities, you can understand why this um, interface is inevitable and they'll come into contact. The contact sometimes is due to the behaviours um, that people with mental illness are presenting to people in, um, in the community that cause concern and lead to them being contacted, uh, the police being contacted to go and look at that. There's an additional complication here though, and that's the complication of stigma. It's the elephant in the room in many discussions and something that's not easy to address. So I want to give you two really brief examples um, which highlight some of the populist misconceptions um, around different aspects. Now, if you heard on the news that um, there was a car speeding 140 k's an hour down um, the main freeway here, you'd immediately think to yourself, that's probably a young bloke in a V8 with go faster stripes trying to impress his mates. I certainly do, some, some of the time anyway. Um, but then if you hear on the news, like I heard the other week, and we hear um, from time to time, that uh, parents have been murdered by their son or their daughter, the immediate thing that springs to mind is, and the first question that's asked, is the person mentally ill? Why would they do that? They must be mentally ill to have committed their offence. Now, <coughs> these connotations that come up around mental illness are, are predicated by issues around danger, around violence, around concern. The community has a real concern that they're going to be at danger if they come into close proximity with people who are mentally ill. For that reason, um, over three quarters of people who have a mental illness have expressed that they've experienced some stigmatisation um, in the past. Now, that may surprise you in that sense then, to hear that people who have mental illnesses are significantly more likely to be the victims of crime as opposed to perpetrators. 
One study in the late 90s by a famous Chicago criminologist called Linda Teplin suggested that people who are mentally ill are 11 times more likely to be the victims of crime than those who are not mentally ill. <coughs> so what have I been doing with the police? Um, well, we engaged in a five-year program of research that's continued on um, up to date, and we continue to look at various aspects of police work. What we found more generally is that contact with people who are experiencing mental illness is commonplace. Um, research has found maybe up to 10% of police contacts involve people who are, are mentally ill. Um, what's interesting is that the contacts are equally as likely if the person is a perpetrator or a victim. We've also found some beautiful examples of what we've called the social welfare role that police have now adopted. Um, so they've embraced this broader role that they perform in the community. Um, a, a lovely example, there was a policeman that I spoke to in Melbourne who said that every week um, this lady would phone up. She had a paranoid disorder and she would phone him um, 3 o'clock every Thursday afternoon. And she'd say, look, um, Dave, I'll call him Dave just for argument's sake, I'm really concerned. I think my neighbours are tapping my phone. I think they're opening my mail. I think they're watching me. And what um, the constable would do, he would take the phone onto speaker and he would sit there and he would be doing his paperwork and he'd listen to her. He'd respond to her and he'd reassure her. And that made her feel better and she always thanked him at the end of the discussion that she felt that she was safe and she would put the phone down and say, I'll speak to you same time next week. Now, that's all well and good, but what's even more fascinating is that this particular police officer moved on. Um, and so he got one of his colleagues in the station to take over that role from him. So when she phoned up next Thursday at 3 o'clock, there was someone there who, the, who the, um, she could listen to. Now, psychiatric crisis is common. We know that. There's a number of elements associated with it. So significant life stresses, domestic situations that are often alcohol fueled, and the person is presenting as a risk to themselves or to others. Police expressed a real concern that they're resorting to using excessive force to manage these situations. Our research confirmed that as well. If you look at the um, representation of mental disorder in police fatal shootings, for example, over a 25-year period, we find that all major mental disorders are significantly overrepresented. For example, rates of psychosis are um, 11 times higher in the fatality sample than the, the rate you'd expect to find in the general community. So they're right to think that they're using more force, and they're right to think that there's something that's going wrong with the traditional way that they're approaching this. What we need to do now is to really understand how they're engaging and what different approaches they need to use around giving the person time, giving them space, giving them opportunities to be involved in the decision-making to resolve the situation without resorting to more force. Um, in terms of the broader systemic challenges, obviously policing doesn't work in a vacuum and there's a whole ream of arguments around the provision of public mental health services, the scarcity of resources and um, really the whole issue about you know, if, if someone's in need of support and care, can they access that? And we found all too often they can't and the police are left um, picking up the same person the next day or the next week for in a similar crisis situation because our services aren't meeting their needs. And what's very interesting with this last point, um, when I spoke to victims of crime, it can be the little things that count. Quite surprisingly, it's not really that someone finds that, um, <coughs> uh, that the perpetrator is, is uncovered for the crime, but it's really that they've just been listened to by the police, that they feel that their experience has been validated and that they feel that they've been believed. Really quite simple things there. So it's not about necessarily catching the person, but just um, going through that process. So my ideas, or my current research directions, apart from the overhaul of public mental health services, there needs to be a couple of um, focuses to this. One is on crisis services, so psychiatric crisis services, which um, can help meet the needs and address the um, crisis situations being experienced by people in the community. The second is aftercare, and that really links into my second point about providing better supports and information for carers and family members. We really don't understand what their needs are, but we need to better understand those and listen to them so we can um, meet their needs in a better way. Information sharing is the key to this. Uh, in terms of a whole of government response, no one service can address this significant public health problem. And so people need to work together and they need to share information so when police turn up on scene, they're equipped with the, the best information possible to help them address that situation. And why young people? 
Well, young people, um, you see that the onset of major mental disorders happens in late adolescence. You also see this as the basis for where ideas, ideas, information and opinions are formed. So when they start to come into contact with the police by virtue of their criminal offending or their behaviours of concern, we can see how stigma can start to come into place. We can look at the formation of attitudes and we can see how the importance of that impacts on future behaviour. The challenge really is to overcome stigma, and we're looking at stigma in terms of youth, in terms of people with mental illness, and also in terms of the police. So that's my big idea, and that's the way I'm going. Thank you very much.